For University of Illinois Extension, I'm Todd Gleason. You know, nutrition and management of the dry cow has been a pretty extensive area of research across the whole of the land-grant system in the United States. And researchers say this is one of the most critical and stressful phases of the lactation cycle. Phil Cardozo, University of Illinois Extension specialist in dairy, now joins us to take up this area. He's written an article that outlines 10 steps for a successful transition period. Thanks for being here, Phil. Let's take up the last five steps in this process. We'll start with amino acids as building blocks. There are 10 of these, of which two, I take it for the dairy cow as it relates to the diet, are limiting. So in dairy cows, the two most limiting amino acids, that's gonna be methionine and lysine. Those are the two. And especially here in the Midwest, we would think and in the US because we do have the ability to feed blood meal that is very rich in lysine, we would think that methionine is one of the most limiting in diets. And what do you mean by limiting? What happens? So it's very interesting. Uh, and sometimes we use the analogy of a water uh, barrel and the wood around the barrel would be the amino acids that are forming the protein. But bottom line, if I don't have one amino acid, but I have a lot of the other ones, the protein is not going to be formed or it's going to be formed at the level of the minimum that I have for that limiting amino acid. So we need to feed the right amino acids for the cows so they can produce the milk protein and also use that as source for their health. I mean, there's a lot of things like antibodies and enzymes in the body of the cow that are made of proteins. So if we don't give that amino acid that is limiting, we can give all the other ones, but the cow is not going to increase the protein. It's going to be limited at that level. So I take it with the methionine um, that it sometimes just passes through without being absorbed properly. So there is a way to protect it, relatively speaking, in the rumen so that it's absorbed into the blood? Yeah, that's exactly right. So when we talk about swine or poultry, we can give the, the amino acid directly in the feed and they're going to use the same for us. However, the cow or even the, the, the cow beef or dairy doesn't matter. We talk about dairy here, but they have the rumen. So everything that I give to the cow, actually who is going to use it is going to be the bugs. The microbes in the rumen are going to use that and the cow never going to see it. So we do need to protect, and that's where there are several uh, commercial products available, a lot of technology on it, how to do it. Uh, but the idea is that we can protect, so that get passed through the rumen and goes specifically to the duodenum, where it is absorbed, and then it ends up in the blood, in the system of the cow, so she can use that. So you wanted to see whether this actually works or not and whether it had an impact on both health and uh, productivity uh, in the cow uh, and its ability to protect the uterus? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect right. So right now at the U.S., we know that the prevalence of endometritis, so we would call um, some sort of infection in the uterus of the cows, pretty much cows after calving, if they don't clean right, if there's a little contamination with bacteria or some of the placenta is still there, that can cause fever and can cause some inflammation or infection in the uterus of the cows. So, and that is, it runs around 30%. So 30% of the cows in the U.S. suffer something about that. So we were thinking about, okay, we know that if we feed rumen protect methionine, cows usually produce more milk. They usually produce more protein. However, do they also improve the uterine health that could lead to better fertility in the future? How, how are those related, though? I'm not sure I understand how the methionine is related to the protection of the uterus. Okay, so in a broader sense, we could think about if a cow is well-fed and she has the ability to produce as much protein as it needs, then all those enzymes... And all those cells, one of them being the white blood cells or the neutrophils, that's one of those white blood cells that are helping to clean the uterus, they are going to have a better ability to go from the blood 
to the uterus and clean all that thing after calving. So, that was our idea. So essentially, if the cow is healthier because of the proteins that are there and methionine's the, the limiting factor, uh, the white blood cells can do their job better just because she's healthier. Does it work? Perfect. That's, that's what we wanted to test. And what'd you find? So what we found was that, so we measured the amount of uh, neutrophils in the uterus, and we do that uh, counting the number of PMNs, polymorphonuclear, so it's amount of white blood cells in the uterus. We did that at 15 days after calving, 30 days after calving, and at 72 days after calving as well. And what we saw that at 15 days, the cows that were eating the methionine product, they had a higher PMN than the control. However, at 72 days, that situation switched. So the cows in the methionine had lower PMN, lower white blood cells, and the cows in the control had higher PMNs or white blood cells at 72 days. And that's good or bad? So that's a good point that I think we sometimes don't talk enough about inflammation. Is it good or bad? And I think we can, we need always to put in a perspective of the timeline. So where is that happening in perspective of lactation or days in milk? So we believe that it's what happened with the supplement uh, with the addition of methionine is good because at 15 days we do want a lot of white blood cells in the uterus to clean out the material and make sure that the cows don't get sick. However, at 72 days, I want lower amount of white blood cells because that's the moment where I'm going to be breeding the cow. So the whole situation of the semen meeting the oocyte and having the whole conception, that needs to happen with lower interference from white blood cells. So I think what happened was, yeah, I think by giving the cow what she needs, the amount of methionine she needs, end up helping her in the beginning recruiting more white blood cells. And then at 72 days, she didn't need those white blood cells there because they already did the job in the beginning. And I think that's beneficial for the cow. Does the work give you a recommendation for on-farm use at all? Yeah, so I think the the idea is to, you know, farmers and nutritionists work together and first identify what are the ingredients in the diet and make sure they are looking at how much methionine they are feeding to the cows. So all the nutrition software softwares out there, they are able to produce that. And also the lysine. Even though we did the methionine, I think it's important to look at those two. And if there is a need to include that as a commercial product or just change ingredients in the diet, some way, if they want to maximize the fertility of the cows, they should be feeding what is the requirement of the cow. Thanks, Phil. Okay, thank you very much. Phil Cardozo is a University of Illinois Extension Dairy Specialist. I'm Todd Gleason.